Imagine if in the United States, they let you give a Bible to every kid in our schools. Well, that's exactly what happened in Fiji. We're taking you there today on In Grace. Fiji, what an amazing and beautiful country. It is a paradise, but once you get in off the beach a little ways, it's actually a pretty hard place to live in. We went to Fiji and we saw amazing things, a great spiritual hunger in a nation that used to be cannibalistic. Then they became Christians and then they became nominal Christians. In other words, the, the faith of their parents wasn't the faith of the children. They would go to church, but they didn't know God. We got to go to Fiji and see revival. We were able to go into schools, in public schools, in Hindu schools, in Muslim schools, in Catholic schools, and we got to give these children a Bible. But you know what the administrator said in each of these schools? They said, Pastor, we don't want you just to give them a Bible. We want you to have an assembly and tell them what the Bible's all about. You can't tell a pastor something like that because, wow, what a golden opportunity to tell them who the Bible's all about. Of course, the Bible's about Jesus Christ. And Fiji is a place that is really opening up to the gospel. I think you're gonna to love today's In Grace program on location in Fiji. It's a lush tropical paradise known for its beautiful sandy beaches, stunning coral reefs and crystal clear water. However, behind the facade of beauty lies a story that shows the depth of human depravity. This island's history is filled with idolatry and cannibalism. Yet in the midst of this darkness came a light that brought about unbelievable revival. This is the story of God's grace and a miracle only He could orchestrate. Dr. Ball, you have been to Fiji 35 times. That is correct. This is a place in which your heart is and you have a, a tremendous burden and passion for the people yes. of the islands of Fiji. Uh, tell me how you came to Fiji the first time. Just so happens that Fiji is the farthest land distance from Israel in the world, on the map, on the globe. It is 8,604 nautical miles from Israel. Now that lands in the South Pacific, but the nearest landmass is Fiji itself. My heart is in Fiji, and there's, there's a reason for this. Forty years ago, I was reading a book of sermons by the late R.G. Lee. In it he said, or he wrote, in far off Fiji, when a person dies, the next of kin climbs the tallest tree or the highest mountain nearby and calls out to the spirit of the departed dead, come back, come back. Then Dr. Lee said, but until this moment, no one has ever had a visit from the departed dead. And he went back to his sermon, but I couldn't. The Holy Spirit drove that reality to my heart and I knew I had the answer. They can meet their loved ones for eternity and I'm debtor to them, I have to get the gospel to them. First of all, I didn't know where Fiji was. I had to find it on the map. Then I said, I need a good independent Baptist missionary that I know is true to the Word of God and I'll support him heavily. Well, I searched, there was no such thing. Then I said, okay, I look for a good Bible missionary of some kind and I'll, I'll support him. And I didn't know that technically you cannot be a missionary to Fiji. You can arrive in Fiji as an advisor if you're already in Fiji. For three years, the Holy Spirit drove me. I wrestled with this. And I had established the Calvary Heights Baptist Temple in St. Louis, Missouri, and God wouldn't let me rest. So 
36 years ago at Thanksgiving time this month, 36 years ago, I took my son, my associate, his wife. I took the minister of music, his wife, and a businessman and his wife, and we made our way to Fiji. I had read that you can't preach in Fiji unless you have a permit to preach in Fiji if you're a foreigner. Well, I, of course, a foreigner when we were a team, a group. Made our way to Suva. I went to the magistrate's office and I said, I'd like to get a permit to preach the gospel in Fiji. Here's my resume. And I was president of a small college, uh, et cetera, had lectured at various universities and so forth, background. He read it and he said, you're a Baptist. And I said, that's correct, but I'm a Christian. He said, you cannot preach in Fiji unless you are already in Fiji as a recognized group. We have no Baptist in Fiji. He said, we have Christians, but not Baptist. I said, I'm a Christian. He said, but you're a Baptist Christian. Okay. So he said, I cannot give you a permit to preach. So I thanked him and I turned and he said, however, with your background, I can give you a permit to lecture on comparative religions. I thought, oh, well, what more could I ask for right now? So he started writing out the permit and, and then he stamped it. And as I reached for it, he said, I must let you know that you cannot present the leader of your religion, Jesus Christ, as being superior to any other religious leader. Here's your permit. Well, I took it and gulped. I took it, but I could not imagine presenting Jesus as just another religious leader. So I went to the hotel. We had a prayer meeting. I let the people know the problem. We made our way to Mount Victoria to the little beautiful village of Waikumbu Kumbu. It's picturesque. And, and so as we were in this little village, uh, there was a young Methodist pastor who was just taking his appointment. And uh, he was lighter skinned, so we struck up a conversation. And he spoke English very well. And I, I told him that I would like to be introduced to the chief the Ratu to get his permission to preach the gospel. He said, well, I know where his home is. We made our way up the path and it was a bure, uh, a rather large bure, and uh, thatched on the sides, but it had windows, etc., shutters. We made our way into uh, the chieftain's interpreter, had to take our shoes off, sat down, and the interpreter, who's also the bodyguard, took the request. I said, I have brought musicians with me. We would like to bring music and I would like to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to your village tonight. And so he spoke in Fijian that I didn't comprehend. The chieftain said something and his bodyguard interpreter said, Thoratu asked, will you drink kava with him? Uh-oh, decision. One of the men in the church that I pastored in St. Louis, knew we were going to Fiji. And he said, now, of all things, don't drink the kava. It's called kava, uh, grog, and yangona. I said, is it alcoholic? He said, it's not alcoholic, but it's made with a pepperminthal plant, the roots, after they dry it. And he said, it looks like mud, it's called grog, looks like mud, and uh, you drink it and it tastes like mud until it gets about here. And then it just fills instantly every cavity of your head and respiratory system. He said, it just blows your head off. So here I was sitting in front of the Ratu, the chieftain, wanting to preach the gospel. And he doesn't say yes or no to preach the gospel. He says, will you drink kava with me? Well, I'd also read that that was an honor to be asked to drink kava with a chieftain. So I said, we will be happy to drink kava with you, won't we, Reverend Wagner, to my assistant? <laughs> and he said, well, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, the uh, interpreter forwarded that to the chieftain. He clapped three times and they started making the grog. They mixed it and it looked like mud. So I leveled it, slowly drank the whole thing. Sure enough, 
It looked like mud, it tasted like mud until it got right about there. And then it just filled every cavity, just blew my head off. I mean, <laughs> through the cavities. And the interpreter said, the Ratu says, you may bring music and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight at seven o'clock. I'll never forget the way he said clock, clock, seven o'clock. So at seven o'clock, we were there. As we approached his bourree, it was packed with the villagers. The men were standing around the walls, looking in, and then they looked at us and welcomed us, got inside, there was not room for another soul. There was the chieftain sitting in place. So I preached a few sentences and then in Fijian. And when I finished preaching, maybe a 20 minute message, I asked them to bow their heads. And I asked, how many of you realize that you are sinners bound for hell and you have no hope outside Jesus Christ, please raise your hand. Every hand in the room went up, including the chieftain and his mother. And then I said, head still bowed, will you pray this prayer with me? In your heart, in your mind, pray this prayer. Dear God, I'm a sinner. And they interpreted in Fijian, they prayed in Fijian, just like a rumble. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. I know he died for me. I know he arose from the grave. I receive him as my savior. Every person in the room prayed. Every hand went up, including the men standing around the side, including the chieftain and his aged mother, all trusted Jesus Christ. So we rejoiced. Then I realized I was in trouble. I had a permit and I showed each of them the permit to lecture on comparative religions but technically I was preaching the gospel. And while I was doing it with the permission of the individual chieftain and his village, I was making it a practice. So went back to Suva to the hotel, had a prayer meeting and I expressed the plight we were in. My associate Ron Wagner said, uh, do you know a fellow from Fiji called you a few months ago? His name was Joseph Sammy, the head of child evangelism for all of Fiji and maybe he can help us. Yes, looked in the directory, made a call, he had a telephone. Reverend Joseph Semi, yes, an Indian man. Joe, we've got a problem. I have a permit to lecture on comparative religions, but we can't preach unless we're already in Fiji. And Joe Semi said, but you're already in Fiji. I said, what do you mean? He said, Frank McGinnis came five years ago a pastor, Baptist pastor from the Carolinas. And he held a meeting for a week and my family got saved in that meeting. And he baptized us. And, and we've been holding family services in the basement of our home here for five years, waiting for you to come. I said, but we have to own property. He said, you know, and I can hear him say it right now. Last week, Mr. Singh, the owner of the property next door, and this property, told me he wanted to sell that vacant property at number 12 Matuku Street next door. I said, where does he live? He said, he's in Ba across the island. So we loaded up the men. We bought the property on the spot. It was registered within a couple of hours. It took an absolute miracle. And my heart has been in Fiji all along. A lot of our programming is trying to show you that there's a lot of pain and suffering in this world, but God is good and we still see God working in the world. But when people ask you the question, why does life hurt? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna answer that? Let me send you my book, Why Life Hurts, understanding why God allows pain and suffering in this world. I'd like to send it to you as a thank you for your gift of any size. If your gift can be $35 or more, we're also going to send you an audio series, a series of messages that answer that question, why life hurts. If you can send in a gift of $75 or more, I'd love to send you five more books, Why Life Hurts, so that you can give these out to people that are hurting. For your gift of any amount, we will send you the book, Why Life Hurts. For a gift of $35 or more, we will include the companion teaching series containing the powerful truths of God's demonstrated love through life's difficult times. 
As a special thank you for your gift of $75 or more, you will also receive five additional copies of Why Life Hurts to share with friends and family. Just call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv for more information. Call now, 800-78-GRACE. Now we return to today's show on location in Fiji. At this point, we've cataloged over 3,000, just in these 10 days, over 3,000 precious souls having received Jesus Christ. And I must explain a little bit about what we did yesterday, which was we were invited to a special school. And we were having services in the evenings. We would do the Bible distribution during the day. In the evenings, uh, you were invited to speak at this church that you really begun here in uh, Suva. And we wanted to see if we can get more people to come. So we had some flyers printed up and we were out in the street passing them out. Saturday night, I was on the last little stack that I had talking to two young boys who were sitting in a closed cafe. Suddenly I'm surrounded by about 30 students and two teachers. And I was a little worried at first, <laughs> wondering what's going on until I realized that they were on a field trip. Some had mental handicaps. We would say handicaps, but God, I think, sees it a little differently oh, than yes. we do. Yes. He, he knows what he's doing. But they had disabilities. And the teacher said to me, she said, Pastor, we've been looking for a place to go to church tomorrow with our students as we're on this field trip. And I said, well, I know the perfect place for you to come. And you know what? They showed up. They all marched all in. All marched into the service. And we had a glorious service. I gave a little Sunday school. You gave the morning service. And we had teachers, especially the one main teacher, yes. indicate salvation. And many of the students understood the gospel too and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ themselves personally and were saved forever. What a joy that has been, but it didn't stop there. For I got a phone call a few days later, the same teacher saying, we're having our closing ceremonies. We'd love for you to come as our special guest. Yes. We arrived. Who else was the special guest? the ambassador to Fiji from Australia. Yes. And so he was able to hear the gospel as well. All the students, all the parents, and all the teachers. It just one thing happens after the other in this amazing land. Again, what a blessing it is to serve the Lord here. I believe God loves Fiji in a special dimension. Uh, that ambassador had also been a part of the monitoring group in Iran and Afghanistan relative to uh, radioactivity and now he came to Fiji, so he's really a high-profile individual, and he heard the gospel because you gave it to him, and he was given a Bible, and a Bible bookmark. One of the things that really stands out in my mind, back in the Nandi Toka area, uh, some of the schools were huge schools, and hundreds of students got the gospel and indicated that they were trusting Jesus Christ at that point in time. Now, the audience needs to know that early in the history of Fiji, the Methodist Church and Congregationalists and Presbyterians came in, but primarily the Methodist Church, and they really preached conversion. And that first generation truly got converted, got saved, born again. However, the succeeding generation thought they were Christians just because they were born in a Christian home and a Christian family. And now we have four generations or five generations having grown up thinking they were Christian because they are Christian in name, but without being born again. So as we go into these schools, they know the gospel songs. They've recited John 3, 16. Even in public schools, they know the basic gospel. But now you give them the opportunity to trust Jesus Christ personally. Personally, that's the key. Uh, personally. That's, that's the key. In one of the schools, actually, a school that had the name and is operated totally in Islam and has the minaret and everything. They have to respond because of the mandate of the government. But they said you can only meet with the students that have a Christian background. There are hundreds of students in that school, but there were 39 plus teachers, 39 students that had a Christian background. So we met with them. And while we did, you pointed out that standing around the windows were Islamic people listening in to the message. Every one of the 39 students trusted Christ and received a Bible. 
And then some of the Islamic students came up. They couldn't get a Bible by the regulation of the school. So we have their photos of them getting as close as they can to their buddies who do have Bibles. What a beautiful thing. But at the same time, our hearts break realizing that some of those students were at our fingertips and we couldn't touch them. First school that we went to was an island. Yes. A little island that had a little school, but the school was full. Would, of, would you tell about disembarking from well, the big boat I, to I, the little boat? I felt like we had gone back a couple hundred years. Yes. As we're getting out, uh, we're getting toward the, the, the island and we're expecting a dock or something, but he says, okay, everybody, take off your shoes and off your socks. And roll your pants up. Roll your pants up. <laughs> And there we were carrying boxes of Bibles ashore onto this little island. When a soul is born again, not only is the life changed, but they're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. That's greater than the miracle of walking on the water, of bringing back the dead to physical life, greater than the miracle of healing of blind Bartimaeus and others, cleansing the leper. One soul being saved is greater than all the physical miracles because it affects not only time in their lives, but all eternity. And here we're, we're seeing thousands of students. And do you realize, I'm sure you do, we've talked about this, these Bibles are now in the homes of over half of the families in the entire nation of Fiji. Every time I think of Fiji, I think of God doing amazing things. It almost seemed like we were back in the New Testament, back in Acts, as the church was just beginning and people were so excited because you could really see God at work. We saw God at work in the lives of these children. So many were answering the call to salvation. They were saying, yes, I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's something you've never done. Maybe you've been religious. Maybe you're a churchgoer. Maybe you go, I don't know, a couple times a year. But you don't know for sure you're going to heaven. That's the gospel. That's the message of the Bible. That's the message we brought to Fiji. And I'd like to bring that message to you today. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. These children knew exactly what we were saying. We're sinners, we need a savior. They were putting their trust in the savior. His name is Jesus. He died for you on a cross. He rose again the third day. Believe in him, which is to trust in him. And when you do, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. A lot of our programming is trying to show you that there's a lot of pain and suffering in this world, but God is good and we still see God working in the world. But when people ask you the question, why does life hurt? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna answer that? Let me send you my book, Why Life Hurts, understanding why God allows pain and suffering in this world. I'd like to send it to you as a thank you for your gift of any size. If your gift can be $35 or more, we're also going to send you an audio series, a series of messages that answer that question, why life hurts. If you can send in a gift of $75 or more, I'd love to send you five more books, Why Life Hurts, so that you can give these out to people that are hurting. For your gift of any amount, we will send you the book, Why Life Hurts. For a gift of $35 or more, we will include the companion teaching series containing the powerful truths of God's demonstrated love through life's difficult times. As a special thank you for your gift of $75 or more, you will also receive five additional copies of Why Life Hurts to share with friends and family. Just call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv for more information. Call now, 800-78-GRACE. Coming up this summer, we're gonna commemorate the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing with a special exclusive interview with astronaut Charlie Duke. Once you left Earth orbit, it had to work. Oh, Ron, it's finally here, Houston. 
The walk on the moon was really exciting, but the walk on the moon is nothing like the walk with Jesus. We are going to take you on a search for temple treasure. Most scroll scholars would tell you the copper scroll by itself is very boring. It's like reading an old grocery list or an old inventory. It's the grand sum, it's the potential for the holy items that it's pointing to. That's what makes the copper scroll so thrilling. The third location on the copper scroll, it says 900 talents of polished gold. We are gonna take you on an archeological adventure in Shiloh. The tabernacle was there for hundreds of years and they're finding more and more and more. When you do an excavation, you get a lot of artifacts, buildings, and all kinds of material, but it's silent. It has to be interpreted. And the Bible is your number one source for the history of that area and what took place there. The Bible says that God smote the Syrians and they fled. Well, Sennacherib tells us the same story. That's ancient history right there. The Pentagon represents the mightiest military force in the world. And at 936, we felt a large explosion. It was a life-changing day we should never forget. You definitely want to set your DVR and record every single In Grace episode. Don't miss one of them. And you will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's word. Thank you for joining us today as we find victory in life through God's abundant grace. I'm inviting you to our 2019 Grace Conference. As we stand firm on the truth of the Word of God, the clarity of the gospel of grace against the new waves of Calvinism, we hope to see you this June. Join us for two days of powerful Bible teaching with over 40 workshops and roundtable forums. Visit graceconference.com today to register. Hi, I'm Jim Scudder, the pastor here at Quentin Road, and the Bible tells us that God is love. Our church is a place where you can experience His love. God has given us His Son, He's demonstrated His love, and we believe that. We've received the love of God, and I believe that's the one thing that's going to really stand out for you when you visit us here at Quentin Road Baptist Church. You're gonna find people that love God, and they care and will love you. So I hope sometime soon you'll come and see all the things that we do from old fashioned Bible preaching and teaching to great kids ministry and a lot of other things that we do around here. We want you to experience God's love at Quentin Road.